Once there is no individual property, then we can work for a perfect, revolutionary society. In democratic Kampuchea, there is no exploiting class, and thus, no longer any victims of the exploiters. Dedicate yourselves to renouncing and destroying all imperialist, feudal, aristocratic regimes. They are all reactionary. Embrace the proletarian consciousness. Long live the correct and extremely clear-sighted Communist Party of Kampuchea. These different lines of Khmer Rouge dialogue represent just a fraction of the many ideological slogans that were unceasingly drummed into both the general population of democratic Kampuchea, as well as the cadre who made up the party's ranks. For those familiar with some of the themes of Orwell's 1984, these slogans can be seen within a similar framework. For instance, the famous line, Big Brother is watching you, has an almost direct Khmer Rouge equivalent. The Ankar has the many eyes of the pineapple. The idea is simple and total. The organisation is everywhere, sees everything. We have complete control of this country, its people, and even their minds. This was the prison with no walls that Cambodia had become. Many more of these kinds of slogans are found within the compilation that was made by French historian Henri Lockard, who collected them from survivors in the years after the regime ended. Some of these slogans have become almost synonymous with the regime's horror, the most infamous being no gain in keeping, no loss in weeding out, or sometimes given as Keeping you is no profit. Losing you is no loss. A chilling line, which is recalled by many that lived through this period of history. But something else is made very apparent by the other lines that I quoted earlier. We've got references to classes, something called the proletariat, as well as imperialist and feudalist regimes. And Locard suggests that these oral slogans were used to help create the revolutionary man, to spread communist maxims, to teach the radical ideas of the revolution while utilising a quite traditional method of learning, one that would have been familiar to those who had spent any time in Cambodian Buddhist monasteries. But these new proverbs and sayings were related to ideas that came from elsewhere and were completely hostile to any traditions from the past, but promoting the idea of history moving forward toward a perfect future. In late September 1977, Pol Pot delivered a four-hour speech to his party, but it was also broadcast on radio and intended to be received by a wider audience. In it, he detailed the regime's ideological emphasis on national defence, self-reliance, radical egalitarian collectivism, agricultural and industrial modernisation, and the dictatorship of the proletariat. He also revealed the existence of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, which was in charge of the country, and had up until that point been kept secret from the world and its own people. He also said that Ankar, or the organisation in English, was a Marxist-Leninist party. More than 30 years later, one of the members of this organization, would be put on trial for crimes against humanity 
at the extraordinary chambers of the courts of Cambodia, or commonly known as the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. His name, Kang Gek Il, better known by his revolutionary pseudonym, Doik, the former head of the Khmer Rouge Security Systems Apex, S21, the infamous interrogation centre that we introduced in the very first episode of this series. In the afternoon session of his trial on the 9th of April 2009, Doik was questioned by one of the international judges that sits on the tribunal's panel. This question was in reference to Doik's role in a prison known as M13, which was in operation before the Khmer Rouge had taken complete control of Cambodia, a place where Doik would hone his skills as an interrogator and torturer before his latter role at S21. Judge Laverne was asking a fairly direct question to Doik, one that had been asked by a great many people since the Khmer Rouge regime fell. How it could possibly be that Khmer people would behave in such a fashion to their own brethren? Why had Cambodians killed fellow Cambodians? Doi gave a fairly succinct answer for what is an immense question. I'll read the English from the transcript for you. Thank you for the question. It was about political issues. First, as I told you already, it was to smash the enemy spies. It was the class struggle. In the liberated zone the base was in, well, the class line, the proletariat class line was introduced. That's why Khmer people killed Khmer people, blindly, because of that principle. In this episode of In the Shadows of Utopia, we are going to begin the explanation of, as I've tried to show here, an extremely important facet of the Khmer Rouge their revolution, and the nightmare that they will bring to Cambodia. Doik said it was class struggle that meant Cambodians killed Cambodians blindly. Pol Pot said that his party, the group that controlled the country from 1975 to 1979, was Marxist-Leninist. And we listened to a handful of the ideological slogans that were heard constantly throughout that regime's time in power. We need to be able to understand what they're talking about, what their intentions were. In the last episode, we spoke about Cambodia's introduction to modernity through the French protectorate. But in the 19th century, these ideas of modernity were forming in very interesting ways. And reactions to this world were also being considered and spread. We are turning away from Cambodia for now to speak about those cold, dry winds that will end up being integral to the formation of the hurricane that will destroy the country in the 1970s. We're going to trace the beginnings of communist thinking, build our understanding of Marxist vocabulary, and see how this ideology, this doctrine, will find its place in the world long before Cambodia becomes the location for one of its most radical revolutions. Okay, welcome back everyone. As I've outlined in the intro there, we are primarily looking back to 19th century Europe in this episode. And this will add to the series in two ways. First, a basic introduction to communist thinking, 
And secondly, we can fill in the gap in our picture of world history that was left slightly blank after our discussion focused on Cambodia in the early 20th century throughout the last episode. So, just like how we needed to touch on elements of the French Revolution to be able to explain nationalism, but also important aspects of European and French history, you know, because they are also factors that will influence Cambodian history, we will sort of follow a similar path throughout this episode. Because this conversation is going to eventually need to span basically the Industrial Revolution all the way up until World War II, I felt perhaps this would be a good one to split into two parts. Part one is the formation of socialist and communist ideology, right up until around about the point of World War I. This will be focused basically entirely on Europe. Part two will open up the discussion to the first communist state after the Russian Revolution in 1917, through to the internationalizing of that movement, with particular reference to the integral locale of Vietnam, as well as Stalin's Soviet Union and the impact of the Second World War. Essentially the beginnings of the Cold War. So, a lot to unpack. We can think of this episode as explaining the Marxist part of Marxist-Leninist, or communism in theory, while part two will explore the Leninist part of that equation, or communism in practice. On that note, it will probably not require me saying this, but we really can only afford to just scratch the surface of a topic as immense as this. To approach something as complex and dense as the Cold War and its beginnings, well, you really have to start with a particular angle to do so. That angle for us is Cambodia. So think of this as a catered kind of greatest hits album. These are my 15 or so songs out of a catalogue of, I don't know, the first band that comes to mind that has been around forever is like Iron Maiden. They've got 150 songs. They're still making them. There is no greatest hits album that you can make of Iron Maiden that will please everyone. You will inevitably leave out a song that someone out there thinks is their best song. But this is my attempt to pick and choose certain parts of the history of communism and the Cold War that I think will eventually be really important for answering that question that Judge Laverne asked Doik. Why did Cambodians kill Cambodians? And just one last thing before we start. And it's something that I'm not sure really warrants addressing, but just in case. So I'm aware that socialism and even communism are topics that carry a certain political baggage into our modern discussions. You might feel quite fervently one way or the other here. And I just wanted to stress that this show is not designed with a political agenda in mind. This show is about providing context to a tragic period of history. A period of history, I should say, that no side of the Cold War comes out looking particularly better for. But part of that history is communism. The Khmer Rouge were communist. And to understand aspects of their regime, we must understand the basics of that doctrine or political ideology. We must understand what they were trying to do. Okay, so with that in mind, we'll, we'll get on to it. We're going to start with one half of the partnership that will end up bringing around the dawn of communist theory. Friedrich Engels. As the book he wrote in Manchester in the mid-1840s, titled The Condition of the Working Class in England, gives us a great starting point for our discussion. The Industrial Revolution. In 1842, Friedrich Engels had been sent to work in the family business. He came from a pretty well-off German family that owned a number of factories. One reason for his trip to England is that he was a bit of a rebel. 
rebellion in these days, meaning that he was not too interested in following his father's footsteps in the family business, getting pretty deep into philosophy at university, that kind of thing. He had also started dabbling in socialist ideas and penning critiques of what he saw as the ills of society that were stemming from industrialization. But perhaps causing the most strain with his devoutly Christian parents was the young man's atheism. Well, an easy fix to this, as his parents thought, was to send the 22-year-old Engels from Germany to Manchester, where he would work in the office of one of their factories. Manchester was at the heart of the industrialised world, and the Engels family owned a factory that produced one of these new industrial products. Sewing threads. Here is the introduction to the book that Engels would write during his stay in Manchester, and I'm not going to do a German accent. Here's the quote. The history of the proletariat in England begins with the second half of the last century, with the invention of the steam engine and of machinery for working cotton. These inventions gave rise, as is well known, to an industrial revolution, a revolution which altered the whole civil society One, the historical importance of which is only now beginning to be recognised. England is the classic soil of this transformation, which was all the mightier the more silently it proceeded. And England is therefore the classic land of its chief product also, the proletariat. Only in England can the proletariat be studied in all its relations and from all sides. End quote. Okay, so let's unpack some of that. We seem to already be knee-deep in some jargon. Uh, the one that's being bandied about a fair bit, which I'm sure you've noticed, is the term proletariat, which we will get to in just a moment. But first, some context. We've already touched on his personal circumstances, and that Engels had already been developing an outlook that is in one way or another, a reaction to industrialization, And he begins by explaining just how big of an impact this has had. He said it had altered the whole of society, and he's not wrong. It's kind of hard to comprehend just how fundamental this change in society was, particularly for those that were living through it. A possible modern example of this that you and I might be able to relate to would be the changes brought on by the massive influence that the internet and things like social media now have on our lives. I grew up in the 90s and slowly saw computers become a normal part of life. And then the internet became another layer of that normalcy. And then just in my early teens, must have been around 13, 14, that's when what we would now call social media became a thing. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to call this a technological revolution. And the impact it's had on how we communicate, interact, economics, politics, society, is something that will probably be looked back on and studied as its own kind of historical dividing line by future generations. But there are reactions to this revolution, aren't there? People wondering, particularly in regard to social media whether this has been a positive impact, what it might do to our mental health, what it's doing to our politics. It's hard to really know while we're still kind of in it. And the changes it is producing in our lives and society, well, they're still ongoing. Whatever the verdict may be on that, it's easy to say that we've become accustomed to the products of this revolution. Indeed, a generation is growing up with no exposure to really any other way. This recent internet revolution has occurred in this, well, I guess you'd say slightly less tangible space in our lives. But the results of the industrial revolution, well, they are all around us and form what we probably take for granted as basic living conditions. Trains, cars, easily produced cotton t-shirts, strong metal cutlery, 
All of these are products of the revolution that Engels was living through and reacting to. The Industrial Revolution occurred on much more tangible ground. Indeed, it was often built out of the ground. Basically, developments had occurred in Britain that served to increase the production of certain goods and materials, which then had also necessitated advancements in the technology to produce more of said goods and materials. Textile manufacturing began using steam engines, which then needed better metal to produce more efficient engines, requiring advancements in other areas. All of a sudden you've got better tools, mass-produced clothing, stronger cutlery, better metal for rails, then you've got railway networks, better steam engines for the trains, for the ships, more pumps for deeper mines, more raw materials to build more factories, which you could then organise in big towns, cities, powered by engines and coal mines. That's all a fairly condensed version, it's certainly missing a lot of details and a lot of depth. But the results of these changes were immense. Politically, it led to Britain becoming the world's industrial leader, and one of the most powerful nations globally. But the Industrial Revolution would spread around Europe and the globe to the New World as well, as the resources that could be supplied by European colonies became that much more important in this industrial system. Markets around the world became interconnected in a new way, and the need to claim territory to produce more raw materials, that much more pressing. One of the most important changes that the Industrial Revolution would have, however, is on society itself. Let's return to Engels, as he was a intellectual, itself a fairly new concept, and he had a front row seat to this revolution and it led him to write his book as a means of assessing the fundamental changes that he saw occurring in society, and in his view, for the worse. As he said in his intro, this revolution has produced a new class in society, the proletariat, and it is the living conditions of this class and their status in society that he is developing ideas about. He says that before the Industrial Revolution, the same task of producing cotton was generally undertaken in the home, spun and woven out of raw materials. I guess you could say traditionally, and without too much pressure on those conducting this business, who in turn lived a fairly comfortable life from the wages they earned from doing so. Quote, So the workers vegetated throughout a passably comfortable existence, leading a righteous and peaceful life in all piety and probity, and their material position was far better than that of their successors. They did not need to overwork, they did no more than they chose to do, and yet earned what they needed. End quote. Engels isn't overly praising of what I guess we could call the old pre-industrial quasi-peasant classes. He says that these static peoples were intellectually dead, and lived only for their petty private interest, for their looms and gardens. They could rarely read or write, regularly went to church, never talked politics, and listened with inherited reverence when the Bible was read. They were exceedingly well disposed toward the superior classes as well. He adds quotation marks to superior. He goes on to say that, and this is a direct quote, They were comfortable in their silent vegetation, and but for the Industrial Revolution they would never have emerged from this existence, which, cosily romantic as it was, was nevertheless not worthy of human beings. In truth, they were not human beings. They were merely toiling machines in the service of the few aristocrats who had guided history down to that time. The Industrial Revolution has simply carried this out to its logical end by making the workers machines pure and simple, taking from them the last trace of independent activity, and so forcing them to think and demand a position worthy of men. End quote. 
we can see in these passages that Engels, well, first of all, he's quite good with words, isn't he? But that he has a quite stark view of the current situation, but wasn't exactly enamoured with how it had been working previously either. In the first few chapters of his book, he goes into great detail about the effects of industrialization in agriculture, industry, and elsewhere, how it's transformed society, and one particular class that has been a result of this transformation is the aforementioned proletariat. So, who are they? Well, that previously static group within the old society, in the case of the cotton industry, were the ones that used to weave and sell their own cotton, using traditional methods as we looked at. As Engels has suggested, they would have gone about their business, quaint as it was, learning the skills and passing them on, owning their bit of land and selling what they could. But the introduction of these new means of production, like the factories that Engels' family owned, meant that new specialised machinery and tools were produced that rendered these old cottage industries obsolete. So, as they can no longer sell what they used to own, they've been turned into a new working class. The industrialised workers in the factories. The proletariat. A development that he says will force them to think and demand a position worthy of men which is a hint to the idea of progress and conflict that we'll get back to later. But, as for understanding who the proletariat are, that's essentially it. The proletariat are a working class that don't own anything. They can only sell their labour. And the new factories are the places that they can sell this labour and earn wages. But industrialization hasn't just affected this lower strata of society. If you were in the position to own a factory, that means you own the means of making these materials, and you are then concentrating your profits when selling on these new mass-produced products. Then you employ more people to work these machines to produce more items, gaining more profit, building more factories. So what you've got is a process beginning from industrialization where a smaller and smaller group of people own more and more of the economic system. Wealth is concentrated in this smaller, more powerful group or class, and as it costs a lot to, say, buy a factory, or the machinery within it, this class is essentially out of reach for those that are outside of it. The Industrial Revolution is, in this sense, a moment in history where big business and manufacturers, well, they really begin to flourish. This creates a new wealthy and powerful middle class. This is the new class in society which, in classic communist parlance, owns the means of production. The factory-owning class. Or the bourgeoisie. The Industrial Revolution was... Well, for lack of a better phrase, revolutionary. It was affecting all of society, but it affected different parts of that society in different ways. While some benefited and made extreme amounts of money, climbing the social hierarchy into this new owning class, others fell downward. Previously content and comfortable members of the old middle class like skilled labourers or those in similar areas, they were unable to compete with the industrialised versions of their products and had to look elsewhere for employment, often by joining the huge numbers of people from the countryside that were flocking into the new industrial cities to sell their labour in factories. I know it can be quite jarring when getting used to these different terms, but when you boil it down to a factory scenario... With the person that owns the factory, the machines that make the products, and the people that have to work on these machines, it can be quite easy to follow along. So if you hear the word proletariat, you can feel free to think of a person with not much money, in overalls, 
with some, I don't know, oil on their face from working to make frying pan handles all day. And the means of production, well, that's the big specialized machine that he or she is using to make the handles with like 50 other people in rows either side. And the factory owner, well, they are in the class that has that lovely Marxist term as well. Bourgeoisie. We'll talk more about these class designations in a moment, but for now let's talk a little bit more just about the effects of industrialization as we try and understand the angle that Engels is coming from here. He's really reacting to what he perceives as the plight of this new working class, and perhaps reasons that they might demand a more worthy position. To do so, we can look not much farther than the less than pleasant world that this new industrialized class was living in. As Engels identifies, this new class, the proletariat, they were entirely a product of the Industrial Revolution. And, being as this was a relatively new development, there was little interference from governments into the way this economy was running. This can be called a laissez-faire system, where businesses and corporations are setting the rules and regulations, with freedom to do as they please, and with little other than maximising profits being their goal. And as you can imagine, the person on the bottom of that hierarchy at this point in time was fairly unlikely to be treated with the most care. Because there was this huge migration of labour into these new industrial cities, the amount of labourers meant that wages were quite poor. And if you, well, you don't like the wages, well, it's tough titties. A factory owner ha- probably has a number of people that could have your job instead of you. The work itself was extremely regimented, repetitive, and quota-driven. You're generally going to be working a 12 to 16 hour day, six days a week. Another unfortunate outcome of this system was the inclusion of children in the workforce. Often kids as young as six were supporting their families and working in the factories. The details here is uh, is probably as sad as you can imagine. Naturally, the work was dirty and dangerous, made worse by the frequent beatings handed out to these young boys and girls. The Sadler Report, a commission by British Parliament into the working conditions of children in these factories, well, it reads like the worst parts of some Dickensian nightmare. Outside of the factories, conditions weren't great either. Because these towns and cities had grown so quickly, and with little thought to the hundreds of thousands of people who would arrive in droves to try and get work, the housing itself was often hastily thrown together. They had no indoor plumbing or toilets, rarely even windows. The air was thick with smoke and terrible smells from industry and humans. They were overcrowded too, often with whole families living in a single room. Typical diet consisted of potatoes, weak stew, tea, and alcohol consumption was, perhaps understandably, considering the lifestyle, quite high. Disease was prevalent. These are the conditions that led to Engels not only writing about the plight of this class in a book of essentially that title, but also a kind of warfare between these classes, about how individuals in these cities were seen less and less as human beings and more as an instrument of capital. He describes the working class neighbourhoods in London, Manchester, Birmingham as slums. He passionately describes the conditions he sees at length. But one paragraph stood out to me in which he describes the report of some officials after an encounter that they had in one of these working men's homes. Quote, On Monday, January 15th, 1844, two boys were brought before the police magistrate because, being in a starving condition, they had stolen and immediately devoured a half-cooked calf's foot from a shop. The magistrate felt called upon to investigate the case further and received the following details from the policeman. The mother of the two boys was the widow of an ex-soldier, 
and had had a very hard time since the death of her husband to provide for her nine children. She lived at number two, Paul's Place, Quaker Court, Spitalfields, in the utmost poverty. When the policeman came to her, he found her with six of her children literally huddled together in a little back room with no furniture, but two chairs with the seats gone, a small table with two legs broken, a broken cup, and a small dish. On the heath was scarcely a spark of fire, and in one corner lay as many old rags as would fill a woman's apron, which served the whole family as a bed. For bed clothing, they had only their scanty day clothing, Poor woman told him that she had been forced to sell her bed frame the year before to buy food. Her bedding, she had also pawned for food. In short, everything had gone for food. The magistrate ordered the woman a considerable provision from the poor box. End quote. As I said, this is just one example plucked from the numerous that Engels gives, but it does give you an impression of the conditions that we are talking about here, but also just how he could write and convey with such emotion. He was reacting to the moment he was living in. He was identifying trends and outcomes that were around him. In a latter section of the book, he asks, How is it possible, under such conditions, for the lower class to be healthy and long-lived? What else can be expected but an excessive mortality, an unbroken series of epidemics, a progressive deterioration in the physique of the working population? End quote. It's a good question. Where was all of this going? What's the point? Well, as Engels wrote this book, he had been in communication with the other half of the intellectual partnership that is so important here. Karl Marx. And it is this other half of the partnership, represented by Marx, that will provide answers that give all of the conditions of the working class a purpose, a direction. In fact, a crucial step in human history was occurring, and the proletariat, according to Marx and Engels, is going to play a starring role. Soon the duo will join forces and produce one of their most infamous works, The Communist Manifesto. The revolutionary ideas of Marx and Engels are going to go on to affect millions of lives and they still remain highly influential into the present. But it's important to highlight the notion that their theories sought to synthesize many of the ideas and forces of their time. Not only the Industrial Revolution, but also political movements and philosophical developments. The French Revolution, as we saw a couple of episodes ago, was a rather radical step in modern politics. They literally murdered their king. They extinguished the old way of doing things. They presented a new model of society that did away with the aristocracy. As we also saw, the revolution ended up turning inward, eating its own instigators. As well as anyone who challenged it, the revolutionaries resorted to terror and murder to sustain their goals. And it was unsustainable. Napoleon ended up taking advantage of the revolution and declaring himself emperor, embarking on a series of wars to claim as much of Europe as he could, eventually being defeated in 1815, around about 30 years before the time we're talking about here. While the status quo was generally restored, even the French monarchy, there were those that saw hope in some of the revolutionary ideas that had burned so brightly. Perhaps there was a way of creating a new society where cooperation and 
peaceful association could create a kind of utopia. Perhaps the French Revolution could be retooled. Some of these groups that tried to do this identified with socialist ideas, a concept that we can loosely define as the public ownership and control of property. And it kind of idealizes a new and different cooperative kind of society. In fact, some groups tried to set up different communes in America and France and Europe to varying degrees of success. The philosophical developments that affected Marx and Engels came out of Germany. The notion that ideas themselves were the driving force of human history, and that history itself had meaning and direction, this is generally associated with the work of Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, and he was hugely influential on both members of this intellectual partnership. One aspect of Hegelian philosophy is dialectics, which generally refers to a kind of method of discussion or argument involving two opposing sides. The clashes or collisions between these two sides leads to an outcome of progression if combined with ideas of history having direction and transcendent meaning. If you combine this philosophical idea with the study of history, and combine them giving history itself a kind of direction and meaning coming out of these events and clashes, it gives history this progressive feel, this idea that it's going toward something greater. And as I stammered through that, you can probably tell that philosophy wasn't my greatest subject back at university. But we will see how Marx uses this idea in a moment and get a feel for the dialectic or dialectics as it applies to Marxist ideology. So, we've got political revolution, industrial revolution, and philosophical transformation. That is the new and changing world that these two intellectuals are trying to make sense of. More than that, they will also attempt to formulate a theory that not only identifies the trends that they're living in, but as they suggest, will be able to scientifically predict the outcome. Let's talk about these two intellectuals for a second. This dynamic duo. They kind of were this odd couple. Like we saw how Engels was from a rather wealthy background, he was also quite handsome, his writing very good as we saw, and he also had an attractive personality by all accounts. His father, a fundamentalist Christian. Karl Marx was from a Jewish family in Western Germany, the Kingdom of Prussia. He attended Berlin University and got his PhD in 1842. He then married the daughter of a baron. Like Engels, he was atheistic and was never really brought up or trained in the Jewish tradition, but due to some of his more radical views and traits, he was unable to get a job as a professor. He was careless in his appearance, had sloppy writing, and was apparently quite bad at meeting deadlines. He also had a domineering personality and was fond of arguing. The British historian A.J.P. Taylor said that Engels possessed great talent, but Karl Marx, well, he possessed great genius. In fact, when the two men first met, as Engels was travelling to England, to, to Manchester, the family business back in 1842, they didn't get along at all. But as we saw, they did keep in touch, and Engels sent many of the articles that he was writing to Marx, who he found to have a lot in common with intellectually. When they met again two years later, they got along much better. It was then that they began writing out their ideas in the Communist Manifesto, which they finished editing in 1847 and published the year after. So, let's break this open and talk about Communism. I feel like we are at an almost Seinfeld-esque point here where we can ask, what's the deal with communism? Well, Jerome, why don't we start with what the dynamic duo themselves suggest 
which is that it can be summed up in a single sentence. The abolition of private property. But, I don't know, I feel like we can unpack that a little bit more, can't we? And now that we've established when these guys were coming up with these ideas, let's look at the Communist Manifesto itself and see what they have to say. The first page of the manifesto contains the famous line, The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Going on to say that, The modern bourgeois society that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms. It has but established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. End quote. Okay, so this is kind of making sense, right? Here we're getting a peek at the fundamental part of Marx and Engels' theory. And we can fill in certain areas of this theory from further writings that one or the other would work on, like Marx's Das Kapital. So, from that argument, it follows that if history, defined as the story of human society, if that story is about struggles between classes, and classes are generally defined by wealth and power, correct? Well, then all of human history is actually, at base, economic. For Marx and Engels, economics is history. The most important thing about society, its structure, how and why it organises itself, this all depends on the way that resources are used. All of human activity, and therefore all of human history, is the story of people fighting for material resources. And because there is a finite amount of money and materials in the world, History is therefore about the struggle of classes for these materials. That quote also mentions that the struggle is ongoing, and that new classes had been established. Those are the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the classes formed as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And, like the rest of human history, these new classes are in opposition to each other, and struggling and the capitalists, the factory owners, the bourgeoisie, they are currently winning. This theory is known as dialectical materialism, or the materialist view of history. Dialectical, with that Hegelian influence, because the idea was that clashes over resources, over material, over economics, would lead to progressive outcomes. History has a purpose, a direction, and clashes between the classes for material push it forward. For Marx and Engels, human history had progressed through to its second to last stage. Capitalism. This we can loosely define as an economic system operating in a free market, with private ownership of the means of production and property aimed at the competitive pursuit of profit. Sounds just about like the opposite of the definition of socialism, right? Now, this second to last stage of history, capitalism, has led to those two new classes being formed, the industrial proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The class struggle between these two will be the last. This is the title fight. This is for the championship. And it is becoming a global struggle. As they say in the manifesto, the need for ever-expanding markets, quote, drawing even all the most barbarian nations into civilization. In that quote, we can also see a hint of something I think is quite interesting. So, naturally, we all kind of think of Marxism as an innately anti-capitalist theory. And it is, in the sense that it espouses a system that is quite different from capitalism. However, within orthodox Marxist thinking... As history has its direction and stages, all of the nasty results of capitalism, all of the things that Engels passionately decried, these fall within a necessary stage, a necessary development in history's progress. They claim that the bourgeoisie has played a critical and revolutionary part in this historical story. Because industrialization at the hands of the capitalist class has brought so many people into the proletariat, and as this new working class swelled and the conditions they faced remained so unsatisfactory, 
logically this would reach a point that produced a reaction by the working class. This is what Engels mentioned in the book that we looked at earlier, when he said that at least industrialization pushes these vast swaths of society out of, and I believe the phrase he used was silent vegetation, or a state of being not worthy of being considered that of a human being. So all of this comes back to this idea of history with direction, clashes that produce progress, that history has a meaning and an end point. It's almost like quasi-religious in some ways, which is interesting considering how anti-religious it is. Marx and Engels contend that in this penultimate stage of history, the forces of capitalism at the hands of the bourgeoisie have led to the centralization of nation-states, the advancements in science and agriculture that have seen the modern world develop, but they place these developments into the stage that will see the final clash. The clash that their scientific theory predicts capitalism is inherently going to produce. They had not only defined human history and the events they were living through, but they were stating what was going to happen next. At the time, and as we saw, relentless competition and low wages meant that the proletariat was constantly growing, the bourgeoisie becoming smaller, with once prosperous people dropping down into the ever-growing proletariat. Now, because according to these guys, history is actually a class war, and because the traditionally wealthy classes, now the bourgeoisie, always had advantages in fighting that war, money, political power, etc., they will never voluntarily relinquish the resources or the new means of production. Quite literally, that means that the factory owner is never going to give the factory and the machinery within it and the materials you need to run it, they're never going to hand all that back to the people. So, what must the workers do? Well, Change will be impossible if the proletariat does not realise what their situation actually is. They've got to be able to see the Matrix. Is the Matrix still a relevant cultural reference? I'm not sure. Anyway, if they lack the consciousness of this class warfare, they will never organise themselves in a manner to participate in history. The communists contend that aspects of society, such as religion, nationalism, and even concessions to workers, like the trade union movement, all of these are just smokescreens created by the bourgeoisie and their allies to keep the workers submissive and content with their lot in life. The only answer, therefore, is revolution. Here's how Marx and Engels close their manifesto. Quote, Their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Workers of the world, unite. End quote. Basically, the plan of the communists is to wrestle back all capital from the bourgeoisie to centralise all production in the hands of the state, i.e. a country that is ruled by the proletariat, sometimes called the dictatorship of the proletariat, a phrase we heard earlier, and this would organise the working class to be the dominant ruling class. Now, they do leave the details on what happens next just a little bit vague. But the general idea is that a classless society would ensue. All would work according to their abilities and be rewarded according to their needs. And because all would have the necessary material conditions of life, all would be content and class struggle would cease. Therefore, history would end with a worker's paradise, a paradise for everyone. There is a section that briefly outlines a few steps that can be taken for this new society. Ten points that they say might be different in different countries And while a few of these points illustrate the path they were recommending, there is hardly a solid blueprint here. For instance, and naturally assuming that the proletariat is now in control of this particular country, we've got number one, abolition of all private property. Who didn't see that one coming, right? 
5 and 6 relate to the centralization of all credit in the hands of the state, as well as means of communication and transport. So again, everything is run by the state. 7 relates to the extension of factories and instruments of production, but now in control of the state. So more products, more places for work, surplus everything, right? Number eight is about the equal liability of everyone to work and the establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture, which I presume you could think of as a kind of standing force of labor to work specifically on different agricultural projects if and when necessary. Nine says a gradual abolition of all distinctions between town and country and an equal distribution of the populace around the country. 10, the final point, says free education for all children in public schools and the abolition of children's labor in factories. It also mentions that education should be combined with industrial production. Again, this is fairly ambiguous. It's not really a manual. You can't make a country out of those 10 points, so you, I mean, you can try. It does seem to vaguely rely on ideas that as long as you centralize everything and get everyone working and equalize everyone, then it will all just kind of work out. While it places all power in the hands of the state, the dictatorship of the proletariat, it also predicts that states themselves would lose relevance once this workers' paradise was fully realized. I know it's a fair bit to sink in, but let's just retread that ground slightly. Marx and Engels had identified in their view that industrialization had brought about the second to last stage of history, capitalism. Marxists contend that capitalism is an unstable, unnatural state of human organization. It led to the division of society into two opposing classes, the working class, or proletariat, who were only able to sell their labor, and the owning class, or the bourgeoisie, who had the wealth, materials, and means of production, which we could simplify to those who were working in the factories and those that owned the factories. As this capitalistic system is all about competition, then eventually more and more wealth would be accumulated by fewer and fewer people. Steadily, the bourgeoisie would become smaller and the proletariat larger. For Marx, history was inevitably moving toward a final class struggle, a scenario where the workers realize their position and take control of the system, abolishing all exploitation, create a new society where there would be no classes, where the state would eventually wither away and politics would cease to exist. The world would become communist, and this revolution was not about compromise between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Human society was going to be broken and remade anew as the class struggle was finally ended in a paradise of plenty. In the latter part of the manifesto, they say, quote, the communists turn their attention chiefly to Germany, because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of European civilization, and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England in the 17th century, or France in the 18th, and because the bourgeois revolution in Germany will be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. End quote. Just as the evangelical minister might see signs of the times, so too did Marx and Engels. They poured over every word in the manifesto, as they believed they were charting the very future of human history, and they saw Germany as the prime candidate for revolution, essentially because of its industry and developed working class. In fact, the publication of this document, which was really kind of a pamphlet, that was designed for just a handful of workers that had organized and were calling themselves communists, well, it came out just at the same time that a series of revolutions would spark up around Europe. The 1848 revolutions. The reverberations of the French Revolution, half a century earlier, were still on display, and the impact of that political energy produced by the rise of nationalism. In fact, these revolutions were kicked off in, where else, but Paris. 
We touched on this ever so briefly a few episodes back, when we discussed the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, and how France kind of went back to having a monarchy for a bit, but then eventually ditched it in favour of another republic under Napoleon's nephew. Well, that bit, before he gets elected, that's the 1848 Paris Revolt. The French kick out the monarchy again, and this guy gets voted in democratically, basically because his last name was Napoleon. But then, when his first term was up, instead of following the rules, he essentially staged a coup and declared himself emperor. In what is almost a little mini version of the French Revolution, and then how it came under the control of his uncle. But France was not the only place to see change. Austria, Hungary, Italy, and the odds-on favourite that Marx and Engels predicted, Germany, all saw scenes of revolt and revolution. But these revolutions weren't being carried out by card-carrying communists. The vast majority would have never even heard of the Communist Manifesto or Marx. These revolutions were primarily by liberals and nationalists, looking to overthrow monarchies or unify nations. And they all kind of had something in common. They failed. The 1848 revolutions are quite complex, and we don't really need to go too deep in trying to explain what happened there. But we can look toward the effect it had on Marx, because that will be a bit more important for our story. So, Karl Marx, sensing that these revolutions were an indication of his predictions coming to pass, he threw himself into politics. He went back to Germany, he started a radical newspaper in Cologne, but, as I was saying before, these revolts and revolutions were certainly not all proletarian in nature. As we saw, many are nationalist or liberal, and were reacting to monarchies more than anything else. Although they may have contained socialist elements, they were not focused solely on these issues, and certainly weren't unbounded movements of workers across national borders, like Marx would have wanted. Nationalist tendencies kept the workers from uniting in general against the bourgeoisie as a whole, and different groups or classes in different countries had different outcomes that they were trying to achieve. In these countries, revolutionaries were generally poorly organised, and eventually the status quo resumed. Armies crushed these groups, and the revolutions sputtered out. When the revolution in Germany failed, and the monarchy remained in power, Marx was ordered to leave the country. He lived the rest of his life in exile, in London. So, what went wrong? Why didn't the communist prediction come true? Why were the revolutions in 1848 the last serious revolutions until 1917? Well, the short answer would be that society also reacted, and changed, and adapted to the new industrialised world. The conditions that Engels so passionately decried slowly got better. Unprecedented economic growth and full employment shifted the power back slightly into the hands of the factory workers. In some cases, they could form unions and demand better pay or working conditions. In many countries, they got the vote and had a hand in changing society democratically. And once the population has the vote, politicians have to seek their support and push for reforms that would benefit them. New political parties would grow that would incorporate socialist ideals but without looking to violently revolutionise. Certain ancien regimes still held a lot of power in some monarchies and societies that weren't always geared to completely divorcing themselves from the old ways of doing things. And as we also mentioned, nationalist concerns could often override the globalist thinking that underpinned true communist revolution. If we take Marxist views of society at this time as correct, as some kind of pressure cooker, shaking with potential revolutionary energy, well, certain factors arose that had the effect of just letting that steam out, cooling it down a little. Perhaps the proletariat just didn't have the right consciousness, wasn't able to realise their position at that point in time. Marx tried to analyse what went wrong, specifically what had happened in Paris. How did Napoleon III gain power? 
He thought the nephew of the great military genius was a farcical and inept leader. And Marx blamed the middle class in France for voting him in and giving him a means of clenching power. This class he termed the petit bourgeoisie, a middle class of shop owners and tradesmen. He said that they could not be trusted with their historical role and that they had sold out the proletariat. The life Marx lived in exile was a little bit sad. Various shabby apartments, little to no paid work. He did eventually get around to publishing the first volume of Das Kapital in 1867, and Engels wrote great reviews of it without saying that the two were close partners. He and Engels did found the International Working Men's Association, or the First International, which could be thought of as a kind of conference. It brought together all kinds of different groups and associations, liberals, socialists, anarchists. Marx argued his way to the top of this organisation, but its members disagreed on just about everything. One thing that does come out of this post-revolutions period was a disdain for Russia, which had supported other European monarchies staying in power during those revolts by sending in their army. Marx and Engels considered the Russian Empire to be completely backward and agrarian, and hated the conservatism of the Tsarist regime. Also stemming from this is a view which, as far as I can tell, is more attributed to Engels, and it's this idea about what he considered to be counter-revolutionary races of people. He was quite derisive of the Slavs, saying that they were a people without history, and that these obstinate people would be wiped out, along with reactionary classes and dynasties, in the great impending revolution. This is a minor point here and now, but it is something that we may expand upon later in the series and the Khmer Rouge treatment of certain ethnic minorities. Anyway, this period after the revolutions kind of looks a bit like the moment after a prophecy goes unfulfilled. There is some soul searching, perhaps some revision to the numbers that had been originally calculated. Perhaps the stars had been misread. Perhaps revolution would come about another way, perhaps democratically. We can see this reflected in the directions that socialism or communism took in the 1860s and 70s, with socialist parties established on a national basis throughout Europe, like the Social Democratic Party of Germany. Or for Marx, maybe the dictatorship of the proletariat was still coming. And in 1871, he would say that it had. That was the year that Paris once again went up in flames, and the Paris Commune was established. The Paris Commune was a short-lived political experiment. It lasted 72 days, and although it wasn't really a communist revolution, it would eventually be remembered as one. And Marx, despite having almost nothing to do with it, would be viewed as its instigator by his critics, but also praised as if it was a proof of his theories by those that believed in him. This event put Marx in the spotlight overnight as a dangerous conspirator or some kind of historical prophet. But what was it? Well, that's a good question and one that requires a little bit of background. So, the French leader, Emperor Napoleon III, who was a strange, enigmatic kind of leader. He was certainly not the military genius that his uncle was, and he would be lured into a war with Prussia and the allied states of Germany. This conflict was masterminded by the inventor of real politic, Otto von Bismarck. In what is, I can only assume, a pretty bad move in the old game of military leadership, Napoleon manages to lose the Battle of Sedan, but also get his whole army and himself captured by the enemy. Not a good look. Back in Paris, as they hear this troubling news, an emergency government is formed, and they try to keep the war with Prussia going, which might not have been a great move either. The Germans surround and besiege Paris. The siege goes on for about four and a half months. When you have a country's capital under siege, for almost half a year, 
eventually you will be able to dictate some fairly harsh terms of surrender, which eventually occurs. One aspect of this piece would be the annexation of the French territories of Alsace and Lorraine. Those of you familiar with the politics around World War I will no doubt be familiar with those two provinces. Without spoiling it, this really boils the piss and starts a fairly nasty relationship between France and Germany that will not end well for either in the 20th century. To add insult to injury, another part of the peace deal is a parade of 30,000 Prussian soldiers through Paris and, at Versailles, the former court of the French monarchy, Germany would actually kind of announce itself as a unified country. You've probably noticed me going back and forth between saying Prussian or German. Well, Prussia was the largest province and its most prominent, and the new Germany would be unified under a Prussian king, or Kaiser Wilhelm I. Germany, a unified Germany, was now officially on the map and the seat of another mini-industrial revolution that saw the modern world adjust to things like combustion engines, widespread electricity, and things of that nature. Europe had a new, powerful, ambitious, and rich country right in the middle there. The balance of power had changed, and would require the rest of Europe to adjust accordingly. One of many decisive factors that would bring Europe to a total war in 1914, the first general war in Europe for about a century. But, back to the Commune. So, after the parade of the Germans through Paris, naturally most Parisians assumed whatever provisional government was in power wasn't very strong. They also feared that a new National Assembly might be preparing to restore the French monarchy, again, They knew how this story was going. As a significant amount of the armed forces that had protected Paris in the siege were actually made up of workers who had been drafted into service, they still remained in the city. But when the new government tried to disarm these workers, slash servicemen, a revolt broke out. The government troops were chased off, as well as the provisional French government itself. They all fled to Versailles. So, you've got a situation here where there's a little mini power vacuum in the French capital, and subsequently, a civil war. The Central Committee of the National Guard, a volunteer force, mostly of those armed citizens that had started the revolt, they declared themselves in charge. Which is generally what you do if you've got the guns, a city, and you've chased off the government. Eight days after the initial revolt, elections were held in quite chaotic conditions. Revolutionary candidates were elected, and the Paris Commune declared. Now, the words I'm using here. Just because revolutionary candidates won, and it was called the Paris Commune, doesn't mean that it was Marxists or communists who won. And Paris Commune, well, in French that really just means local or city government, rather than a reference to communism. And these candidates that were elected, they were far from purely proletarian. They were as much petit bourgeoisie, the middle class of shopkeepers, tradesmen, artisans. In Marxist theory, those that hadn't quite fallen into the proper proletariat as yet. This was a new, small government that was made up of a few different groups. You had neo-Jacobins, those who wanted to see a new French revolution set up. You had socialists, although not completely Marxist ones, basically a bit of a mishmash of different Parisians, and they didn't have much time to really get anything done. But in the brief time that the Commune was active, they made some fairly symbolic moves. They reinstated the Committee for Public Safety, just like in the French Revolution. They also brought back that wacky revolutionary calendar, for as long as they could, I guess, which was like 18 days. There were some vague socialist policies, like they brought in a 10-hour workday, but nothing to indicate they were ticking off the list of things to do in the Communist Manifesto. They did seem pretty anti-religious, barring any state support of religion, and going out of their way to mark out a couple of chapels for destruction. But there wasn't enough time to even get that done. Basically, this scenario, this mini-civil war, and the Commune itself, it wouldn't last long. 
The French government, that is the provisional one that was set up following the abdication of Napoleon III, they were able to rally enough forces to put an end to the communards. Not only did the French army set up another siege of the capital, like the hated Germans had done just a few months earlier, but they also sent troops into the city and instigated fighting in the streets of Paris. The communards began killing the hostages that they had taken, and the streets would run red with blood as the troops engaged. The fighting lasted a week, and probably some 20,000 Parisians would die, about 750 government troops as well. These are not insignificant numbers, running close to figures from the Reign of Terror. Paris and France really has gone through a lot, and this was another chapter in that book. Following the end of the Commune, the French Third Republic was established, near the end of May 1871. But what did the failed Commune mean for Marx? Well, Marx and Engels had at first supported their native country in the Franco-Prussian War, but had disagreed with the harsh peace that was imposed. When the Commune had been established, Marx was ecstatic. The International had tasked him with sort of writing up a report about what was going on in Paris, which in fairly typical Karl Marx fashion, he only managed to eventually finish and read out about two days after the Commune had collapsed. Marx said it was the greatest moment in history so far, and that it was a sign of his predictions coming true. It was a sign that a working class could take control of government, and the first living example of the dictatorship of the proletariat. For him, it had been an example of the working class understanding what it took to seize power, a true revolution. He said that, Working men's Paris, with its commune, will be forever celebrated as the glorious harbinger of a new society. In short, it had become a first sign of what was to come for the communist movement. This is how it was being thought of, or how it would be transformed and remembered. The commune had been a politically diverse, tentative experiment, without a coherent unifying ideology. And it had lasted just 72 days but it had proved to be a challenge to the European status quo, both the existing order and also an ideological challenge to European governments. Even though it didn't have a single coherent aim, it had only a handful of participants who were genuine Marxists, but it provided a lesson for future communist revolutionaries who viewed it as an example of how not to do some things as well. Like, perhaps the need for a revolution to have a certain, clear, and singular motive, as well as leadership. One of those communards, an anarchist who had attended meetings of the First International, Eugène Potier, he wrote a song during the Commune, which he named the Internationale, after the Working Men's Association. It would later become a kind of anthem for the communist movement. The final chorus of the song is pretty great, and certainly does give a Marxist flavour to things. Quote, Workers, peasants we are, the great party of labourers. The earth belongs only to men, the idol will go to reside elsewhere. How much of our flesh have they consumed? But if these ravens, these vultures, disappear one of these days, the sun will still shine forever. End quote. Here the Marxists claim that a model for revolt had been set. And despite the Communist Manifesto not being used as a roadmap of revolution, those that feared a kind of class warfare declared Marx to have been its instigator. He became revolution incarnate, a reputation that still holds fairly close. For Marx and Engels, the Commune was not an end, but a sign of things to come. The Paris Commune became a communist legend, part of the theory. Relics from those 72 days would be treasured by future communists. For example, in October 1964, one of the first crewed space flights of the Soviet Union, Voxhod 1, brought with it a ribbon from a communard banner. They brought it into space. But in the 1870s, it was also a source of friction in the socialist world. And at the International, 
Marx's support for a violent revolt was seen as a negative tarnish on those within the movement that wished to achieve their aims through peaceful means, and saw the association of socialism with this kind of event as harmful to their image. The International itself, in 1876, would eventually disband. Marx, whose health deteriorated soon after, would die in 1883, in London, buried at Highgate Cemetery. At his funeral, Engels said that Marx was the Darwin of history, who had discovered the law of evolution, but in human affairs. He said that his name would endure throughout the ages, that he had been the greatest living thinker. Engels himself, after completing the second and third volumes of Das Kapital, out of the notes that Marx had left behind, died in 1895. The two prophets of Marxism, gone. But their legacy, in fact, the tradition that they had started, while reviled by some and idolised by others, certainly lived on. 22 years after Engels had died, in 1917, at the height of the First World War, the dictatorship of the proletariat will finally come to pass. But not in Germany, or England, or the United States. Not the lands of industrialization and capitalism as it was foretold. Instead, it would occur in the backward, conservative, vast and old empire of Russia. Next time on In the Shadows of Utopia, we will look at the other half of the Marxist-Leninist ideology, as communism goes from theory to practice. Lenin, the Soviet Union, and the spread of international communism to far-off places like Indochina. Until next time, this is Lachlan Peters. Remember, you can always check out the website at www.shadowsofutopia.com for more information about the show. And we now do have a support page set up there, so if you would like to do so, feel free to head toward that. But it's always great to hear from you guys anyway, or just see those ratings and reviews. So thanks so much for that, and thank you again for listening. Until next time.